10, Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, commonly referred to as the Blood Countess, occupies a pretty creepy place in history as a Hungarian noblewoman with a notorious reputation. She is believed to be one of the most prolific female serial killers in history, earning her eerie nickname from the gruesome practice of bathing in the red red of her victims. This ritual was apparently rooted in her belief that it could preserve her youthfulness, and it sounds like some pretty extreme anti-aging to me. Operating during the late 16th and early 17th centuries within the walls of her castle, now located in modern day Slovakia, Bathory subjected an estimated 650 girls to unimaginable horrors. Her reign of terror reached its thankful end on December 30th, 1610, when Elizabeth along with four accomplices faced arrest following an investigation into the disturbing rumors surrounding her actions. Despite the severity of the accusations though, a lack of concrete evidence prevented the claims from being substantiated. However, the absence of solid proof did not grant her leniency and she was confined to her castle until her eventual passing. Her evil deeds and the whole blood-soaked castle deal make her a heavyweight in the true crime scene. It's a legitimate horror story with more questions than answers. Would probably make a great horror film though. And in at number nine today is Ma Barker. Ma Barker, a notorious figure in US criminal history, served as the leader of the feared Barker gang, which her sons were also a part of. Gaining the title of the FBI's public enemy number one, Barker orchestrated a series of robberies, murders, and kidnappings across the American Midwest in the early 1930s. Her life came to a pretty explosive end in 1935 during a prolonged standoff in her Florida hideout, setting a record as the longest standoff in FBI history. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI's first director, once described her as the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful criminal brain of the last decade. Hoover's description added to Ma Barker's mysterious reputation, solidifying her reputation as one of the most evil women of all time. Number eight, Belle Gunness. Belle Gunness holds the disturbing title of one of America's worst female serial killers. Even before considering her terrifying actions, she was already an imposing and physically intimidating woman, standing six feet tall and weighing over 200 pounds. It was alleged that she was responsible for the passing of her husbands, younglings, numerous suitors, boyfriends, and even her own daughters, Myrtle and Lucy. Belle's motive was pretty simple. Greed. She gained income by stealing life insurance and assets from her victims. Reports suggest her victim count exceeds 20, with some claiming it could be over 100. Inconsistencies in her postmortem examination, such as the reported height being two inches shorter than Belle's six feet, contributed to her becoming a figure in American criminal folklore, often compared to a female bluebeard, because people will make things up and just run with it sometimes. Number seven, Griselda Blanco. Born in 1943, Griselda Blanco, known by her aliases of La Madrina, or the Black Widow, emerged as a frightening figure in the criminal underworld. Hailing from Colombia, she etched her name in history as one of the most ruthless and feared queen pins ever known. Blanco's notoriety reached its peak as a key player in the notorious Medellin Cartel, a criminal empire synonymous with violence and illicit trade. What sets Blanco apart is her unexpected role as a mentor to none other than Pablo Escobar. However, as fate would have it, their relationship eventually soured, paving the way for a rivalry that would echo through criminal history. Blanco's criminal empire revolved around the transportation of a certain illegal powdery substance from the fields of Colombia to the streets of the United States. This calculated operation, coupled with her alleged involvement in up to 200 people being ushered to the pearly gates, showcased Blanco's audacity and cunning in a male-dominated realm. Her ability to not only navigate but dominate such a perilous environment proved her prowess as a criminal mastermind. Following a stint behind bars, Blanco's life met a chilling end on September 3rd, 2012, when she was wiped out in a hail of lead, leaving a void in the criminal landscape she once ruled. I'm all for girl power, but uh, let's just put that energy somewhere else, shall we? Cool. Number six, Christiana Edmonds. Christiana Edmonds, also known as the chocolate cream killer, was an English woman with a really disturbing hobby. She would purchase chocolates, lace them with strychnine, a powerful and toxic chemical, and then return them to the shop. Unexpecting customers who bought those chocolates would naturally fall ill. In 1871, a tragic incident occurred when a young person passed away after consuming one of the poisoned chocolates. Now following this, Edmonds escalated her campaign by sending parcels of her dangerous chocolates to notable individuals. As the police began linking the fatal and damaging outcomes to the chocolates, Edmonds attempted to deflect suspicion by sending parcels to herself in order to mislead the police. 
How intelligent. Once she was caught, Edmonds was initially sentenced to death, but her punishment was later changed to life imprisonment due to her mental illness. Number five, Mary the First of England. Born on February 18, 1516, Mary the First held the throne as Queen of England and Ireland from July 1553 until her passing. As the only surviving child of the marriage between Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, Mary the First's reign is notable for her brutal persecution of Protestants, earning her infamous moniker, Bloody Mary. Her attempt to forcefully return England to Catholicism resulted in the forced passing of numerous prominent Protestants, contributing to a climate of fear and leading around 800 Protestants to flee the country, unable to return until her passing. During her reign, Bloody Mary implemented the Heresy Laws, which resulted in the burning of over 300 Protestants accused of heresy. Despite the widespread violence, Mary I was never prosecuted for her actions. However, after her passing on November 17, 1558, the winds of change swept through England, ushering away from her staunch Catholic policies. The efforts to reestablish Catholicism were ultimately reversed, marking a turning point in the religious landscape of England. Mary I's reign entwined with religious strife and political turmoil remains a complex chapter in history where power, ideology, and the consequences of persecution shape the course of a nation. Number four, Wu Zetian. Between 665 and 690, Wu Zetian controlled China as empress through her husband, and later as empress dowager through her sons. However, in 690, she achieved a historic milestone by becoming Empress, marking her as China's first and only official recognized female ruler. Wu Zetian maintained her authoritarian position from 690 until her passing in 705. Now, despite the significant achievements in expanding China's territory and establishing it as a powerful empire, her reign was unfortunately also marked by violence and bloodshed. Wu Zetian's rise to power was marked by a series of manipulative and ruthless tactics. She orchestrated the downfall of her political rivals, resorting to schemes such as false accusations, purges, anything to eliminate potential threats. While her success in building a powerful empire is acknowledged, she has faced enduring criticism for the ruthless tactics employed to do so. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Mary Ann Cotton, who lived in the 1800s, left behind a criminal tale that's not all neatly documented. Back then, record keeping wasn't the greatest, so we're left with a bit of a puzzle when it comes to the exact details of her evil actions. But it's estimated that Cotton might have offed around 21 people. Three of them were unlucky husbands, and a whopping 11 were her very own family. She had this not so friendly habit of using arsenic to bring their lives to an end, and then cashing in on their life insurance policies. The party came to a screeching halt however, when she attempted this method on her stepson, Charles Edward Cotton, leading to her capture and the grand finale, a date with the executioner. Now, here's where it gets interesting. They gave her a short rope, instead of the customary long one. This meant that instead of physics causing her neck to snap, she instead suffered a long, slow, agonizing suffocation. Number two, Mary Piercy. Mary Piercy, born in 1866, lived in Kentish Town, North London, with her lover, Charles Creighton. Feeling unsatisfied with life, at the age of 24, Mary sought more, leading her to become romantically involved with a man named Frank Hogg. However, it seems that Frank was also already spoken for, being already married to his pregnant wife, Phoebe. The dark events unfolded on October 24th, 1890, when a policeman discovered the almost severed body of a woman in Crossfield Road, Hampstead, along with a blood-stained pram. Mary's association with the crime drew attention when she displayed hysterical behavior at the mortuary while viewing the body of the deceased woman, later identified as Phoebe Hanelow, Frank Hogg's wife. The next day, the lifeless body of Hogg's daughter was found near Finchley Road, a mile away. This time, the cause was suffocation. As the police became more and more aware of the affair between Frank and Mary, they searched Mary's house and found broken furniture and bloodstains. Mary, seemingly unfazed, played the piano and sang loudly during the search. The police ended up uncovering an axe, two knives, bloodstained clothing, and love letters between the illicit couple. Mary's attempts to explain the stains as a result of taking out mice was met with understandable skepticism. The police gathered evidence from neighbors who had witnessed Mary wheeling a pram away 
away from the house on the evening of October 24th and heard screams from her residence. The disturbing truth emerged during the trial at the Old Bailey in December 1890. Mary's defense claimed insanity, but it proved unsuccessful, resulting in her sentencing to be sent to hell. On December 23rd, 1890, at Newgate Prison, Mary Piercy faced execution by hanging, orchestrated by James Barry, just over a decade after her father, Thomas Wheeler, met a similar fate for a similar crime. I guess it kind of runs in the family. Number one, Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie, Delphine LaLaurie was a prominent New Orleans socialite who lived during the early 19th century. She's infamously remembered for her role in one of the city's most gruesome and horrifying scandals. Born Mary Delphine McCarty in 1787, LaLaurie married three times and became a central figure in New Orleans high society. However, her reputation took a pretty dark turn when her mistreatment of people that she kept forcibly endured came to light. Reports of extreme cruelty and sadistic practices circulated, revealing the disturbing treatment of servants within the LaLaurie mansion. In 1834, a fire at the mansion exposed a hidden chamber where individuals were discovered in appalling conditions, subjected to unimaginable horrors. The shocking revelations sparked public outrage and Delphine LaLaurie fled the city, leaving behind a legacy of cruelty that continues to haunt the historical narrative of New Orleans. Number 10, Clara and Katrina Mororova. Clara was actually a very loving and acceptable mother to her two sons, Andrej and Jacob, where they would take trips and summer camps and she would play with her sons all the time. It wasn't until a new child entered their home by the name of Annika and Clara and her sister Katerina were part of a cult named the Grail Movement. When Annika came into the picture, it was under the support of Katerina and Clara's sister where she was told by Katerina that Annika was a 13 year old who escaped from a trafficking gang that had physically harmed her. Annika was also apparently very sick and suffered many illnesses which gained Clara's sympathy. Clara wanted to adopt Annika after bonding with her so quickly and even had a mystery doctor tell her how to take care of Anika. This same doctor told Clara that her sons were a problem and needed to be cured from their evil spirits. It was then Clara would do an affluent amount of violating and harmful things to her biological sons like shock therapy, making them eat their own flesh, dunk their heads in water, as well as invite others to her cult to do the same. Anika would also lie to make the aggression towards the boys even worse. It wasn't until a man named Edward had a CCTV camera for his newborn baby when Clara was caught in the act. Clara and her sisters were caught and it turns out Anika was actually a 33 year old woman posing as a 13 year old named Barbara, who had a disease that made her look younger than she actually was. She was eventually arrested as well, which if you've seen the movie Orphan, it's actually based where this was from. Clara got 9 years in prison and her sister got 10 years since her sister Katerina actually knew who Barbara was the whole time. Number 9, Cordelia Botkins. However you were in your relationships or affairs, be aware of ex-lovers who might never want to let you go. Cordelia met her lover, a highly regarded reporter, John Preston Dunning, when he was bicycling in San Francisco. At that point, she was 41 years old, at 9 years his senior and although they were already married to their own partners, John was very smitten by Cordelia. John eventually was left by his wife who discovered the infidelity, but for Cordelia, her husband was pretty cool with it. John also had issues with gambling debts and he was let go from his job because he was a heavy drinker. So he had to move in with Botkin's hotel. Their affair lasted for about three years, but ended when John was rehired to cover the Spanish-American War. When he left San Fran, he told Cordelia, baby girl, I am not coming back. And he even reconciled with his wife because he was leaving for Cuba where he helped survivors of the Spanish battleships during the Battle of Santiago de Cuba. Cordelia Cordelia, however, didn't care for this and wanted him back, so she sent anonymous letters to his wife Elizabeth detailing her husband's affairs. Unfortunately, it got worse when Elizabeth opened a box of candies addressed to her and her sister with the words, with love to yourself and baby, passionately and fond of candy. Elizabeth and her older sister died from arsenic poisoning and their father was able to decipher their handwriting from the previous letters to Cordelia and Cordelia went to life imprisonment. Number 8, Mary Sue Hubbard. It was always in the 1950s where a lot of crap happened that led us to the chaos we know today. And for Mary Sue Hubbard, she is also known as the wife of the founder of Church of Scientology, Ron Hubbard. She was sentenced in the federal court in the 1980s to four years in sentence prison for her role in the conspiracy to plant church spies in government agencies, steal government documents, and bug at least one government meeting. She told US District Judge Norma Holloway Johnson that she sincerely and publicly apologized for her actions. Johnson ordered Hubbard, who had been freed pending appeal for her 1979 conviction in the case, to turn herself into the federal officials in three weeks during the time in three weeks to begin serving her sentence. Hubbard, who lived in Los Angeles at the time, was the last of 11 church leaders who were indicted in the conspiracy in August 1978 to go to prison. The indictments came after the FBI raided the church headquarters back then in Los Angeles in 1977, and the raids were said to be the largest ever conducted by the FBI at the time. 
documents introduced in courts by prosecutors in 1979 contended the operatives of the church initiated numerous break-ins at government official offices, including the Justice Departments, and they secretly placed a listening device in the Internal Revenue Services conference room, and all in a apparent effort to combat what the church alleged government harassment. Judge Johnston commented that she didn't know whether the government had harassed the church, but she quotes, Even if I assume there was harassment, I still can't accept what she did as excusable. Number 7. Natalia Guerrera Speaking of religious cults, Natalia Guerrera was definitely part of one where she had sacrificed her own two-day-old infant and burning him to death as part of a satanic ritual. She was finally apprehended by police after evading capture for two years. Just two days after giving birth, Natalia agreed to have a baby, Jesus, quote-unquote, killed after the leader of Antares de la Luz cult and the father of the child, Raymond Gustavo Castillo Gaete, declared that the infant to be an antichrist and that the sacrifice would help prevent the end of the world on December 21st, 2012. Natalia had previously stated in her defense that she was drugged at the time of the murder, but a forensic psychologist declared that the numbers were not under the influence when the sacrifice was carried out. After her sentence, Natalia managed to flee and was on the run for two years. Investigators noted that she had lived in different houses and even changed her identity in order to evade capture. The police also noted that after being apprehended, she did not show remorse and claimed that she was manipulated by the cult and was therefore innocent. Number 6. Eileen Warrenos Eileen Warrenos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to 7 victims and would target specifically motorists, men who would meet her on the road as she acted as a hitchhiker. She was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women and she tried to appeal to the US Supreme Court which was later denied. At that point, she dismissed her legal counsel and terminated all pending appeals. She then would go off to say, in quotes, I killed those men, I robbed them as cold as ice and I'd do it again. There is no chance in keeping me alive or anything because I'll kill again and I hate crawling through my system. I am so sick of hearing this, she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm the one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. After extreme mistreatment, she suffered while imprisoned and the inhumane management given to her by the officers. In her final interview, she expressed to the media in quote, you sabotaged me, society, and the cops, and the system. An attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. Her final on-camera words were, thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number 5. Patricia Kernwinkle As of 2022, Patricia Kernwinkle, now 74, was convicted of seven counts of first degree in August 1969 for the Manson family attacks that left seven people dead. She was also known as the Manson Girl when she was arrested in Mobile, Alabama. It was during the summer of 1969 where Charles Manson ordered his members to end the lives of seven people in Los Angeles, including actress Sharon Tate. During the trial, Patricia Charles' attorney, Paul Fitzgerald, suggested that although her fingerprints were found inside the Tate home, she might have been an invited guest or friend. Seemingly unfazed by the possibility of a guilt verdict and a death sentence, Patricia reported spent much of the trial drawing doodles of devils and other satanic figures. All during the trial, she remained loyal to the Mansons and the family. Demonstrated of this unity included walking hand in hand with Atkins and Van Houten, singing songs written by Manson, as well as shaving their heads and carving a giant X on their foreheads. Number 4. Sarah Alderte. Sarah Maria Alderte Villarreal is a Mexican alleged serial killer who was convicted for supposedly heading a drug smuggling and human sacrifice cult with Adolfo Costanzo. The members of the cult dubbed by the media the narco satanist called her the godmother with Costanzo as the godfather. In 1989, the killings grew more frequent and gained attention when American tourist Mark J. Kilroy, a university student of Texas, a University of Texas student on spring break was abducted. Was abducted. Costanzo's Eldrete and the rest of the cult went on the run when detectives discovered their shrine. They found human hair, brains, teeth, and skulls at the site. Eventually, the police found their hideout. Eldrete was convicted of criminal association in 1990 and jailed for six years. In the second trial, she was convicted of several of the killings of the head of the cult's headquarters and sentenced to 30 years and in prison. If Alderte is ever released from prison, American authorities plan to prosecute her for the murder of Mark. If Alderte is ever released from prison, American th authorities plan to prosecute her for the death of Mark. Number three, Leonardo Cianciulli. Known as the soap maker of Corrigio, Leonardo Cianciulli was a serial killer from Italy. Cianciulli was devastated after learning that her son was going off to prepare for the war War in World War II. To keep him safe, Chan Truly offered human sacrifices. She killed three of her neighbors with an axe and made tea cakes out of their remains. Not only would Chan Truly eat these cakes, but she would also serve them to guests and Chan Truly's third victim, Virginia, who was made into both teas and cakes and bars of soap. Once again, this soap was gifted to friends and neighbors and Chan Truly was eventually sentenced to 30 years in prison. Sort of sounds like the femme version of Sweeney Todd, but a Bath and Body Works edition. Number two, Enrica Marta. Often referred to as a vampire owing to the nature of her crime, it is just generally believe that Marta kidnapped kids off the streets of Barcelona and put them in her work brothel. It's also believed that Marta killed minors and used their blood and remains in various elixirs. She then sold these elixirs to the rich, claiming that they treated dangerous ailments like tuberculosis. Twelve victims have been linked to her, although it's suspected that she killed many more. Although 
Some historians defend Marta and argue that her crimes weren't as bad or as many as the traditional story suggests. She was actually detained and jailed in the Rainia Amalia prison. Further investigation revealed more housing in St. Filio de Yolbergat, property of Marta's family. Here they found remains of children in vases and jars, as well as books of remedies, including a list of rich clients who the police apparently tried to hide from being leaked, including rich politicians, doctors, and businessmen, and bankers. Kind of similar to a case we had in our modern times with a guy whose name rhymes with Lefri Niepsen. Although she was arrested, she was never tried since she died in the hands of her prison mates, and companions ended up lynching her. Apparently, some say her wealthy clients hired the prison to shut her up. It's very interesting how history repeats itself sometimes, as this was in 1913. Proving to be one of Victorian era's most infamous criminals, Emilia Dare could be one of the most prolific serial killers in human history. Back in Victorian England, she was paid for adopting babies in a practice known as baby farming. Amelia Dare turned this into her profession and adopted numerous children. She began by keeping them for a time until they passed of a natural cause, but ultimately turned into disposing them shortly after adopting them, thereby keeping the money without having to raise them. One of Dyer's victims was actually flo found floating in the river Thames on March 30th, 1896, leading to her arrest and eventual execution. While six victims have been confirmed, it's believed that Dyer may have killed up to 400 children throughout her life. In one of the most sensational trials of the Victorian period, she was found guilty and later hung. Queen number 10 is Maria of Romania, otherwise known as Missy, the nickname she earned to match her spunk and vitality. With her father always away, her duchess mother reigned the household, and Marie learned a lot from the independent girl boss of a mother, even though the duchess believed that the apple had fallen miles from her tree. AKA, she saw her kids were kind of dumb, but this this is because Missy, in na namesake of this video, loved to be spoiled. Attending her mother's countless parties, she loved to be in the spotlight. She'd even ride her white horse through the center of them. When it wasn't a party, it was a theater or gown shopping. Missy loved material things and entertainment. It all came to a crashing end, however, when the family moved to Coburg, Germany, and her mother hired an authoritarian German governess who felt the royal youngsters were far too spoiled. She replaced their soft beds with cots, put them on a seriously strict lesson plan, and traded their beautiful beautiful silk dresses with rough cotton ones. However, this seemed to do well for our girl Missy because she became a cross blend between a spoiled socialite and an intense diplomatic leader. She's married off to the crown prince Ferdinand, heir to the Romanian throne in 1892 and has not one, but three wedding ceremonies and elaborate gowns. She often got into verbal jazz with members of the court and became notorious for her independence and rebelliousness. And while world war was running amok, Missy became beloved in multiple countries by people and diplomats alike. She's intelligent, powerful, intimidating, all wrapped in a pretty package. And she even used her status as a fashion icon in a show of solidarity with the Romanian Peasant Revolt in 1907 by wearing Romanian folk clothing, starting a surprising fashion trend as well-to-do women started wearing the traditional peasant clothing as well. When it came time, she and Ferdinand planned one of the most elaborate coronations that Romania had ever seen. The royals built a whole cathedral for the occasion, and then they served steak to over 20,000 people. Missy wore an elegant custom made silk and fur costume, and a famous Parisian jeweler made her solid gold crown. Treat yourself queen number nine is Antoinette. Come on, you know she's gonna come up. Trust me, I'm not the type to smear campaign Marie Antoinette either, because at the end of the day, she was a teenage puppet shipped off to France to forge political alliances as a figurehead. She was intentionally undereducated, yes, but that didn't make her ignorantly evil. Marie Antoinette has become synonymous with the decadence and the unfortunate focal point of the French Revolution. Well, she never said the famous line, let them eat cake. She most definitely displayed grandeur at a time where people were starving, leaving her plagued by gossip and scandal, which she chose to ignore, and that doesn't look very good. She set trends for stuffed bird hats that led to a species being hunted to extinction, and she imported the world's most expensive material at the time, a hand-painted fabric from India, for many of her dresses. She donned gold and jewels. Meanwhile, outside the palace gates, France was growing restless and had chosen its scapegoat. Dubbing her her Madame Deficit, unaware Marie, was blamed for all the country's misfortunes and her family paid for it with their lives. Despite the indignities heaped on her before her death, the sweet girl went to the guillotine calmly and now Marie Antoinette has forever been immortalized as the symbol of class conflict. Treat yourself, queen number eight is de Medici. Catherine de Medici has been mentioned in a 
few of our recent Queen-related videos for her evil, disturbing, and cruel behavior. Maybe take a second and check out those videos too if you're a fan of ghastly Queen drama, and subscribe to The Hive while you're at it. But aside from being a heinous B-word, this Queen also happens to be a pretentious, spoiled nightmare. During her time playing a personal Game of Thrones, she collected an impressive list of titles reflecting her horrid reputation. Madame la Serpent, Maggot from Italy's Tomb, The Black Queen. She had been married to the heir of France, Francis' throne, Henry II, in 1533 in a ludicrously extravagant affair. The French and Italians exchanged expensive gifts, ate exotic foods, and partied late into the night. Henry even spent the evening showing off to his new bride. However, his mistress, Diane de Poitiers, held his heart. Catherine hated Diane. However, when she came to France, Catherine witnessed for the first time the power a beautiful woman could wield on a man in courts. Thanks to Diane and Henry's relationship, which she would watch through holes she drilled in the floor and their walls. Not kidding. Anyways, Catherine, ever the tactician, gained a reputation for surrounding herself with France's most beautiful and desired women, dubbed the Flying Squadron. These 80 or so women were her spies who she'd send into enemies' beds, political meetings, and out into the streets of France to collect her tidbits of information she could use. However, as a patron of the Italian Renaissance, Medici truly spoiled herself in collecting more than just pretty women. The woman's gallery was seemingly endless. She hosted painters and sculptors of the world in her home and procured some of the world's most desirable pieces, which alongside her wealth, she left to Florence, Italy when she died. Treat yourself queen number seven is the shadow queen of France, aka Diane de Poitiers. Okay, so she's an honorary queen, let's let her have this, because Diane didn't have much aside from a keen head on her shoulder and the love of France's king, something not even collector Catherine Medici could obtain. She was married to him. Diane had been around Henry since before Catherine was in the picture, or born, so no wonder she made the woman a third wheel. But Diane earns the dub as an honorary queen for more than just skulking around the king. She was actually intellectually and politically sound. Henry consulted with her, valued her opinion on political moves and plots, and she even wrote several of Henry II's official letters, which she would sign for him. Sometimes they even signed the letters with their couple name, Henry Diane. I kind of get why uh, Catherine was so annoyed, like rub it in her face much. Anywho, how was she spoiled? Uh, well, she drank gold, like literal gold. I'd say drinking gold would like constitute as having some money to toss around, but back in 16th century France, people, especially members of nobility, tried to assuage wrinkles and age spots with a daily tonic of gold chloride mixed with diethyl ether. Seeing as one of the ingredients literally has dye in the name, you know this stuff was toxic. Diane was known for a few other things as whack as this, such as having her own official color in court, which was black and white, because it represented the dark and the light of the moon. Also, when her husband died and she was left a widow, she quite literally reinvented herself to be the Roman goddess Diane and expected to be treated as such. She used Henry's obsessive love for her to reign in jewels, gowns, power, and glory. Treat yourself queen number six is Cleopatra. Come on, once again, this girl had to come up. You had to know. Cleopatra is one of the most famous rulers of the ancient world, renowned for her cunningness, beauty, and materialism. She grew up amidst unsurpassed luxury and inherited a kingdom that was in decline, but it didn't stay that way. Cleo was a mastermind who managed to flip the board and turn Egypt into a literal cash cow before she lost it to Octavian. Like Dimidisi, Cleo, however, was big on collecting items. She cultivated Egypt long before she ruled there, and their identity and product was her most favored from anywhere in the world. She spent her childhood practicing dramatic entrances into rooms and sewing elaborate costumes to depict herself as the goddess Isis, who she came to genuinely believe herself to be. Mark Antony famously emptied the libraries of Pergamum just to give her 200,000 manuscripts knowing she loved a good book. And who can forget he allegedly gave her three gold and jewel encrusted eggs, each more valuable than the last. And then there's the famous story of the pearls, how she had the most elaborate and expensive pearl in all of the land and during a bet with Mark dissolved it in wine and drank it to show her grandeur. Call that a power move. How wealthy was she that she could just drink down a fortune like that? Well to quote, into her coffers went approximately half of what Egypt produced. Her annual cash revenue was somewhere between 12,000 and 15,000 silver talents and to break down how insane that was, the most lavish of lavish burials for kings cost one talent. A half talent was a crushing fine for an Egyptian villager. A priest in her day made 15 talents 
happens yearly. On one contemporary list, Cleopatra appears as the 26th richest person in history, worth about $96 billion today. Treat yourself queen number five is Eleonora. Queen Eleonora Bradenburg grew up pretty pampered and cosseted by her parents, with a mediocre education in all things political and worldly, but a pretty intense one in being a devout wife and a patron of God. Pretty normal stuff for a woman back then, especially the Bradenburg's ancient and well-connected lineage. She grew up in silk, jewels, gifts, and novelty, and when it came time for courtship, she sent men away, more than her father did for low dowry offers, believing herself to be worth way more than that. When it came time for her to be smuggled into Sweden to marry the eager bridegroom Gustav II Adolf, she was head over heels with the man she had barely met. Maria never truly grew out of her childishness and was clingy and dependent on the king. In his presence, she glowed like the sun. In his absence, she was depressed and, and fearful, going into hysterics if he was delayed in returning home or, God forbid, was wounded. When he did die, it was a crap show. Maria teared wallpaper off the walls and ripped her clothing apart. Then she embalmed his body and brought it with her and their heir everywhere they went for months on end. Maria, before and after her husband's death, but especially after she was given power, was known to have exiled high-ranking courtiers and even killed them in some cases should they not comply and grant her desires or tell her what she wanted to hear. She also would confiscate land and property from her subjects without due cause and of course funded her lavish lifestyle and expensive taste by imposing heavy taxes. Treat yourself queen number four is Queen Margarita of Italy and yes the pizza is named after her. I am not kidding, we'll get to that in a minute. This rags to riches queen did have her spoiled moments but she was genuinely a pretty level headed person. She greatly supported the alliance of Italy and the German Empire. Margarita lost her father and mother at a young age but her uncle King Vittorio of Italy ensured she was raised with art and music lessons. She took weekly dance lessons, painted, learned to sing, and sew. By the time she became the first queen of Italy in 1878, she was immensely popular with the people. Margarita was active in cultural organizations, promoting the arts, working with Red Cross, and she's eventually even accredited with introducing chamber music to Italy, which if you've ever been in an Italian grandpa's car is their absolute jam. Icing on the cake, she was a trendsetter, earning the title of the first fashion icon of Italy. And this theatrical elegance and diverse style taste left nobles and commoners alike in awe. After the killing of her husband in 1900, Queen Margarita devoted herself to the role of Queen Mother and assisted her son King Vittorio Emmanuel III in ruling Italy. She always ensured the kingdom rolled in enough cash to meet her lavish expectations however, which is why she's not smeared the way that some queens are for, for spoiled legacies. Treat yourself queen number three is an honorary mention. This lady was not a royal queen but a dynasty queen. Have y'all heard of the Rothschilds? I'm sure. One of the most powerful and shady families in existence, just holding all the world's wealth in their hands. The Rothschild family may be as low radar as possible, but their excessive amounts of money means they live exactly however they want. Meet Panonika Koningswarter, laden with family money being a scion of the Rothschild. But not every heiress has the rebellious period young, evident from most queens on the list who spoiled themselves in their later years. Her scandal was ditching her husband, family, and fortune in pursuit of Mary Jane and Jazz. Panika's early life played out in a way that was expected of her. She married a French baron, she became a baroness in her own right, she raised five kids in an idyllic French countryside castle, and she held fast against the Yahtzee movement in France during the Second World War, even smuggling herself into Africa to decode messages and stuff. But in 1951, war's over and she's had a glimpse into life outside of stuffy regality and packs her bags, abandoning her family. She goes to the Big Apple to pursue dreams of sensuality, decadence, and relaxation all inspired by the glamour of Sin City mafiosto aesthetics. The separation and abandonment shocked the Rothschild family and Panonica is one of the few in their lineage to be excommunicated. She made new confidants in the form of Charlie Parker, who if you know the story literally died in her hotel room choking to death laughing at a juggler, and Thelonious Monk. In fact, when she and Monk were busted for some ganja possession, she took the fall. She instead became a patron of New York's jazz scene, offering support by paying needy musicians, rent, buying them groceries, and visiting them in the hospitals. Treat yourself queen number two is Caroline of Naples and Sicily. So Marie Caroline is the sister to Marie Antoinette, who definitely had the one up on the last name game, despite sharing the first name. It doesn't matter though, because Caroline got to keep her head, so who's the real winner here? Uh, anywho, the two girls were sick as thieves in their childhood, meaning they had the same ditzy, lavish upbringing, despite a strict un education that Caroline underwent. When it came time for her to leave her behind her soft gowns and idyllic countryside and gilded rooms for the marriage she didn't want, Caroline threw tantrum after tantrum. Then, when she gets there, poor girl learns that she was the only one in her marriage prepared for the throne. Her new husband, Fernando, had grown up hunting, playing pranks, and just filling his gut. Dude's a simpleton at best, and it's a good thing she and her mama wrote it into the marriage contract that 
after she popped out her first kid, she would automatically get a voice in Council of State. This is why Caroline was seen as spoiled. Not her riches, which trust me, girl had plenty. Rather, she was smart enough to have her roles legally written and guaranteed. By the men of the court, she was seen as pompous. While the king is fishing and hunting, she becomes the de facto decision maker, so by the 1770s, the Kingdom of Naples had developed a homegrown version of French Enlightenment, a nest of progressive social thought, literature, and arts, etc., with most of it supported by the queen. Treat yourself, queen number one will be Vicky of Sweden. There are a few Victorias of Sweden. This one specifically is a linear descendant of the Wasa dynasty, making her more important than even her kingly husband of the Bernadots. But unlike the other ladies on this list with a royal upbringing, Victoria's just sucked. Strict and Spartan, she was raised to focus on duty. Among other things, her mother ordered her to sleep on a hard mattress by an open window her entire life, believing it would raise her to be a stronger leader. She was given conventional education for her gender and class with a focus on art, music, and languages, and could play the piano, paint, and speak French and English. When she was married off, it was to Crown Prince Gustav of Sweden and Norway, which immediately inflamed excitement from the Swedish people. Her ancestry was that of Swedish royalty's old blood. So by becoming their queen, Victoria brought the blood of old Swedish royal family. Woohoo! She received a very elaborate welcome on the official cortege into Stockholm on October 1st of 1881, and from then on, the Spartan queen became very spoiled by the people indeed. The peoples doted on her, as did her husband, before he started to dislike her, that is. Her popularity also didn't last for a couple reasons. Having spent her childhood next to an open window every night, her health was crap. The queen had to leave Sweden every winter, and the absences upset the people, as well as drove away wedge between her and her husband and they started their own respective affairs. Oh, and one last thing, using her family wealth and her own political interests, this queen spoiled herself by gambling Sweden's political neutrality for her own personal cause. Victoria headed a conservative pro-German faction in Sweden during World War I. This gambled the entire nation and their alliances, and her husband was furious as were the court and the people, but Victoria Ever the Prude was adamant she was right to be doing this. When World War I finished, she lost but virtually all her power and respect. Number 10, Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg. When Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg and Gustav had a beautiful baby girl with a genetic condition causing excessive of hair growth, Maria herself was just deeply shocked. The unexpected appearance of her daughter combined with societal beauty expectations pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous child. Pretty rude. During her husband's battle, Maria tormented her daughter, Christina. When Gustav died, Christina was only 7 years old. Maria blamed her for his death, and for a year, Maria subjugated Christina to harsh punishment, confining her to blacked out, darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for extended periods. Maria even went ahead and placed Gustav's open casket in Christina's room and demanded that she sleep next to it. Maria's mental state deteriorated, leading to Christina's removal from her custody. Number 9, Isabel of France. Isabel of France was married off to England's Edward II when she was just 12 years old. Their relationship would end over their opposing politics and breakdown of trust in each other, also the fact that she was married at 12 years old. Edward was known to keep male favorites close to him. Often as advisors, Hugh Dispenser the Younger became the king's chamberlain in 1318, and he immediately began to push Isabella out of the king's sphere of influence. Edward began to favor Dispenser over Isabella to the point that the two were rarely ever together at all. Eventually, Edward faced conflict with Charles IV of France, Isabella's brother, and Isabella's lands were confiscated and she was left for France. By that point, Isabella was ready to return to England once more. Among other things, she wanted to remove Dispenser from Edward II's court, and her husband refused, though, which turned out to be a big mistake because almost immediately, Edward II's popular support crumbled. He abdicated the throne, and Isabella had Hugh Dispenser executed. With her son Edward III installed as king, Isabella and her new lover ran in. England for a while. Then Edward III launched his own coup against his once beloved mom, and Isabella was forced to give up her income, assets, and most of her land. Number eight, Empress of Julia Agrippina. Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome regularly tried to overthrow her son. Agrippina the Younger was an ambitious person, even as far as Roman emperors and rulers go. She was once the first emperor of Rome, although she spent most of her early life trying to depose her predecessors. She truly believed her and her son had the birthright claim to the empire, and manipulated her uncle Claudius into changing Roman laws about familial marriage so that the two could wed. Claudius's demise has been surrounded by mystery, and some sources claim that Agrippina killed him. Together with her son Nero, she ruled Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Eventually, Nero grew tired of her manipulations and forced her out of power. She attempted to organize political opponents against her own son, and he had her expelled. Number 7, Elizabeth Bathory. Like all fairy tales come with the stem of truth, Countess Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman and alleged serial killer from the family of Bathory, who owned land in the Kingdom of Hungary. Bathory and four of her servants 
were accused of tormenting and killing hundreds of young and old women between 1590 and 1610. During her arrest, it is commonly believed that Bathory was caught in the act of torment as she was having dinner. Most of the witnesses testified that she had heard accusations from others, but they actually didn't see it themselves. The servants confessed under torment, which is not credible in contemporary proceedings. The accusations of these crimes were based on rumors. Several authors have argued that Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of conspiracy. Similarly, during the Salem witch trials, many people insisted that they saw accused witches of flying through the sky. Clearly, neither things had ever happened and are possibly a form of mass delusion or self-interest lies. Number 6. Empress Irene of Athens Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802 CE. Although she co-ruled with her son for two decades, she knew her son was an unpopular emperor. The empress was an ambitious woman and wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire. With the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Ultimately, the mother and son reconciled, however, that wasn't the end. In 786, the public turned against Constantine after he decided to divorce his wife for his mistress, and Irene took advantage of this and once again conspired against her own son. She ordered the arrest of Constantine and gouged his eyes out, and I pretty much think that, you know, I guess blood isn't thicker than water. <laughs> Number 5. Queen Rana Valona I. She had once ruled Madagascar and no doubt she was as fierce as she would have done anything for her kingdom. Queen Rana Valona was the first ruler after her husband, King Radama, had died. During her reign, she got her uncle executed to protect her power and some records state that she ended her mother's life by subjecting her to extreme hunger. During her 33 years on the throne, she isolated the island and ceased much of its trade and goodwill exchanges with African peoples to the west. Also with her critics, she'd force them to eat poisoned chicken skin and vomit it back up and if they survived the ingestion and regurgitation, it proved that they were loyal to her. If they had died, that proved that they had been secretly disloyal and their deaths were warranted. During the Ranavalona reign, the population of Madagascar was cut in half and it took the island nation decades to recover what was lost under her rule. Number 4. Catherine de' Medici Noted as the queen with no heart, the queen mother had a rebellious daughter named Margaret who dared to cross her and Catherine took revenge for this. Catherine would fight over her married daughter's adultery and affairs and it is said that Catherine's scream could be heard echoing throughout the palace. During one instance when the queen Queen Mother found out that her daughter had a new romantic interest. She locked her up in the castle and never saw her again. She also ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. I mean, I'm no psychologist, but it's also considering the fact that Catherine's husband also cheated on her with a mistress and asked on his deathbed to see his mistress and not his wife. And then seeing how happy her daughter was with another man and treated her good, I don't know. I just feel like it's a lot of issues, you know what I'm saying? Number three, Mary the First. Bloody Mary, as she is noted, is actually acclaimed as a heroic underdog that became a monarch and was then mythologized as a violent despot despite being no bolder than her father, King Henry VIII. Being the daughter of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon, she was turned from princess to lady and was separated from her mother when her father left her for Anne Boleyn. When Mary was able to ascend the throne, it was during her five-year reign that Mary navigated challenges as her status as the first English queen. She, like Elizabeth, the first who would reign after her, wanted to focus on wearing the crown to rule rather than being a wife to a king. She prioritized religion above all else, implementing reforms and restrictions aimed at restoring the Catholic Church in England. And most controversially, she ordered 280 Protestants to burn at the stakes as heretics, a fact that would later cement her as a reputation of Bloody Mary. They are where we get the image of the monarch whose raging madness and open tyranny. She was stubborn, inflexible, and undoubtedly flawed, but she was also the product of her time, and incomprehensible to modern minds as our world would be to hers. Number 2. Wu Zetan Empress Wu's rise to power was achieved through cruel and calculating tactics. A popular conspiracy theory stated that she killed her own baby girl and blamed it on the Gozong's empress so that the empress would be demoted. Even so, driven with power that when her eldest son, the crown prince, began to assert his authority and advocate policies, he suddenly died in 675, and many suspected he was poisoned by his own mother. His next heir would keep a low profile or try to, but then Empress Wu accused him of plotting a rebellion and was later on banished. Eventually, a palace coup took place and forced Empress Wu to yield her position, and so the next day, her son Zong Zong was restored to power and the Tang Dynasty was formally restored. Still considering the Golden Era, the Tang Dynasty thrived as a high point in Chinese civilization and a golden age of cosmopolitan culture. Number 1. Queen Isabella I of Spain Queen Isabella co-ruled Spain with King Bernadette II from 1451 through 1504, and her reign was marked by oppression. The notorious Spanish Inquisition began during her rule, and she was instrumental in the effort to expel Spanish Jews and Muslims from the kingdom. In 1492, the same year that she sponsored Columbus's fateful journey, she also decreed that all Jewish citizens either convert to Catholicism or be banished from the country. Jews from the country were brought to the Spanish court to either pledge their faith to the Catholic Church or else be expelled on the spot. As for Columbus, he soon discovered the new world and immediately started slaying and enslaving.
enslaving people in Isabella's name. His expeditions to the New World directly led to the eradications of the Arawak people and the ends of millions of other native and indigenous people, a dark legacy that follows both him and Isabella to this day. At number 10, Blinded by Ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor not empress because she was the sole ruler making her the first woman to do so. Number 9. Topless Duels Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So. Surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is corset poke off but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks that should be a musical not frozen get out of here at number eight no side bays a bad relationship can really mess you up anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de Medici did back in the day her didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken she basically turned into the type of person that was like if I'm not happy no one else is gonna be happy either Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband, though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much. Hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin that you have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. 
Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death, every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad she passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chilonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chalonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. 
Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead or vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chimay. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number 9. No time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. 
And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. 
Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him, and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at our number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest of my family, I kind of get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because there was a little bit of family beef. So she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess 
pissed a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the Queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action, and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. We'll talk more about her later. Number nine, Catherine the Great. So, Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler, and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers, and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones Locker with a legendary frog. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused refused to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons, and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy 
but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy, was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right, technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon. She has an inner 
piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like, damn. Tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it, but to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life. That's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you having a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. 
that king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Brenda Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Ranilova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's horrible. Ranilova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman. He is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. At number three, Evil Empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one-two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part-time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe 
cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion. So, how's that? She ruled over what's considered the well wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapsheput, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth, though, recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdu El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. 
I had to. I had to. Why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks. Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasures, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align, really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three. Brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, 
are part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, so what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal Curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crown still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues, okay? Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace, just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know, just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head, that's sad, it's tragic. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial, so Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest. Horrible. That's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy. Listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. 
So Mary was close, but now what? While Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back, I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rock the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant. Only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like a conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. 
last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. Would you Number 10, Queen of the Nile. For me, it's fun to think about the day in the life of an ancient Roman or Egyptian. I can only hope it was as beautiful as textbooks, movies, and video games make it out to be. But something that I find interesting is that the Egyptians were using makeup all those years ago. Yes, that's right, Cleopatra being the bougiest of all the queens to ever grace our presence, or at least so Elizabeth Taylor would make me think so, had her fair share of makeup use. However, something that may not be fit for a queen was the Egyptian eye glitter. Oh boy, here we go. To achieve this, colorful insect beetles were crushed up and added to an applicable powder, where you would then brush that on your eyes. Look, bugs don't gross me out, but I don't exactly know if I'd want that all up in my business. To be fair, we shouldn't be grossed out because uh, I hate to tell you, but there's some products we still use today that might have a cup or two of bugs in it, just saying. Number nine, Royal Bite. It would be difficult to specify a queen who had this done as there are probably simply too many. And it's more of a, well, service, I guess, than a product, but hear me out. Something I'm just extremely fascinated in and frightened by at the same time. Taking place in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific Islands. Your dentist's worst nightmare. Teeth sharpening, ooh. Considered to be a thing of beauty. Many women, and even recently, have undergone this process of jungle dentistry. I, for one, cannot judge someone else's culture. However, I can judge the experience of acquiring such a look. And I know that just can't be fun. You ever get a cavity removed at the dentist and buddies just drilling into your tooth like John D. Rockefeller looking for some oil? Okay, well imagine someone filing your teeth down like a high school woodshop project. Yeah, no thanks. I get shivers just thinking about it, and all that blood and the powdered teeth just piling up in your mouth, and there's no suction thingy? Nah, that's just the worst, man. Nah, I, that ain't it. I talk to the chief, he's a dentist. That, that ain't it. Number eight, shampoo. What's better than having a hot shower after a long day and just, just rinsing off the woes of the day? Honestly, it's one of my favorite things. For me, a nice hair wash feels good with my favorite shampoo. And because I'm a guy, my body wash, shampoo, and conditioner are all the same product. It's what we do. However, queens of the Inca civilization had more lucrative beauty products, to say the least. I say product because this was a process. What am I talking about? <laughs> Fermented urine. What else, of course? Yes, that's right, the Inca's favorite way to combat those dry scalps was the forbidden lemonade. That's just gross, don't drink that. They would have clay pots filled with the golden broth and then it was cast aside to really let those flavors come together. Or at least I think that's what's happening, that's something a chef would say. Anyway, once it reached the desired level of fermentation, it was then used to clean hair. Oh man, what a way to make a queen stay fresh. Just message to the Incas, just stick to soap, man, don't do that. Imagine just like having a just one just oh just it feels so good. Oh it smells great. I love this. This is fantastic. I love this is so great. I love this. Number seven, foundation. Sometimes all a girl or a queen needs is a little foundation. After all, who doesn't want to have a gorgeous glowing complexion? Especially if you're a queen. The royalty of ye olde Europe felt the same way, except their products were a little different than to what a queen would have today. Some products are hard to pitch and market, but this uh, this would be even hard to market in a Super Bowl commercial. The queens of ye olde Europe fell into a trend of having pale skin. So, to achieve this mixture, it was a mixture of lead and vinegar to coat the face that gave the desired pale look. That just sounds awful. Talk about scandalous. Our queen's makeup makes her smell like she's been working away in a lead mine all day. Naturally, this couldn't have been pleasant, but a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Beauty is pain, and sometimes it's really stinky. Number six, cowboy action. Okay, not exactly a queen, but pretty close. Hear me out, guys. Sarah Winchester was the widow and the heiress of the Winchester rifle fortune. This included $20 million and 50% of shares of the company. Man, I wish that was me. And in case you didn't know, the Winchester Rifle Company was responsible for making guns good when a lot just weren't. 
and that model of rifle unfortunately took a lot of lives. So it's said that the Winchester Mansion was haunted by the ghosts of the poor souls who found themselves at the business end of a repeater. Sarah allegedly was missing a few cards from the deck. All sixes and nines, just, just a little crazy. So in her craziness, it's fair to say she spent some time with a Winchester rifle or two, which is quite a scandalous product for a queen who thinks she's seen ghosts. Plus, women back then, besides Annie Oakley, weren't supposed to handle things like that because it was the 1800s and men were just really mean and stinky and come on guys, give her a break. I ain't that woman can't shoot a gun. <laughs> what are you talking about? Number five, toxic eyes. It's no mystery that beauty products today can be filled with all kinds of lovely chemicals that make you look great. And there's tons of products from the past that could be labeled as scandalous. Well, how about putting literal poison in your eyes? Yes, that's right. Back to the women of Eolde Europe, the very same queens with the pale skin wanted eyes that sparkled. How to achieve this? Well, you just put drops of belladonna in, in your eyes, which, if you didn't know, is poison. Like, just straight up poison. It's bad. It would dilute the eyes, and that was considered beautiful. If you think that sounds like it's bad for your health, that's because it is. Long-term exposure to the belladonna drops would lead to blindness. Yeah, it's kind of a trade-off there. Good looking eyes, go blind later. Yeah, no thanks. Number four, the neck stretcher. No, that is not a WWE wrestler or finishing move, although it really sounds like one, it could be. No, this is something I've always been fascinated with, really, it's just kind of out of this world. I'm talking about neck rings from some African and Asian cultures. Basically, over there in some cultures, the more a woman looks like the Kaminoans from Attack of the Clones, the better. And that means it's time to stretch the neck by slowly placing rings around a young woman's neck until it grows. And then you keep slapping those bad boys on until you've got so many rings on your neck, it'll make you say Sypha Dias. Had to fit a little Star Wars in there somewhere. Truth be told, the neck doesn't actually stretch. It's more the shoulders are dropping from all that weight, which can weigh up to like 15 pounds or something, it's crazy. And if common folk take part in this lengthy procedure, the most beautiful of queens certainly did too. Number three, this, this makes no sense. Look, with all the crazy, super awful, weird things that humans have done, at least most of the time in my opinion, there's a method to the madness. Poisonous eye drops do make your eyes pretty, sure. The urine shampoo does get rid of my dandruff, okay. But with this one, I mean, there's just no way. It, it just doesn't make sense. And I would have no idea how to present this to royalty, especially the queen of the Nile. Toothpaste made from mice, yes. Just how though, I, I, it doesn't make any sense. Like how was a mouse supposed to make your breath feel fresh over some herbs and nicer smelling things? Basically, you cut the mouse in half, like that's a normal thing to do, and then you put that in your mouth. Also, have you ever tried catching a mouse? That's not easy. Is there a mouse farm? So many questions. To me, it's just a really bad look to have the queen swishing around half a mouse in her mouth like some of Listerine's finest mouthwash. Ugh. Number two, blondes have more fun. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a popular hair color. And believe it or not, I used to have natural blonde hair, like super blonde. And then Harambe left this plane of existence and my hair got darker, cause life got darker. Now all I wanna do is listen to MCR in my room and write in my journal about how nobody understands me while MTV plays on the TV my parents bought me in the background. Some people wanna go blonde. This was true of royal women in ye olde times. So time to reach for some good old fashioned hair dye right off the shelf, right? Let's read the ingredients together. Water, well, that's good, okay. <laughs> I got a water. <laughs> a lead, well I got tons of that on my face already, so that's fine. And was this, sulfur? What? Yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> sulfur. Imagine slathering that stinky goodness all in your locks. This was something that the highly esteemed Tudor women actually did, or at least tried. I feel like you need a whole truck of this stuff to work. But then again, the smell. That's not how a queen should smell, is it? It's not right now, you shouldn't, it's not. Number one, the Canary Girls. When Great Britain was at war, the queen was a symbol of their freedom and democracy. True British strength to keep on carrying on. So the next time the queen goes to visit a munitions factory to cheer on the women who are working hard day and night for the war effort, she might want to keep her distance. The high explosives used in the artillery shells, famously known as TNT, I'd break down the scientific name, but we all know <laughs> my track record with reading. <laughs> I can't. It is a very volatile substance, but not just for the explosive capabilities, but it's also toxic. Yeah, I didn't know this, I learned this. Very similar to the radium girls of the same fate. 
TNT with enough exposure can turn skin and hair a yellowy orange color. Now, we can't have Her Royal Majesty showing up somewhere looking like Big Bird, can we? To avoid being a literal blonde bombshell, perhaps stay away from the factory, Your Royal Highness. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of Royal Prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. And she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the door. Or you guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy am asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for Old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was gonna have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts to end her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening and what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the Terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim, or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer. We'll never know. 
Number four, short kings unite. Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just wanna be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room when the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s. At least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time. It was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing. Number 10, Marie Antoinette. I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France. To sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, lay Miz reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Number nine, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Sometimes it's just in the name, isn't it? Like Mario, you know that he's an Italian plumber. Or Luigi, you can tell that that's an Italian plumber's brother. And uh, King DDD, king of the DDDs or, or something, I, I don't know. Okay, maybe the names don't always give it away, but Bloody Mary does. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake or hotter, no cap. Number eight, Raina Valona of Madagascar. This one is a new one for me, didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Raina, I'm, gonna say, I'm just gonna call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, how can I make things better? Huh, I know, how about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes, very uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately, she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and 
yeah, it's a bad thing. And it does bring some bad stuff with it. However, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe. And that's that's good. Money's good. You like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that. So she reformed. And by that, I mean she repressed and, and re-unalive people. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing. It me a familia. You know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taking over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging, Oh, wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's all right, bad segue. Well, the, the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear, sweet mother. Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys, no words. Number six, Fu Hao. Another woman in history married to a man in the stinky patriarchy. Worst, except Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. Number five, Tamiris. Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization VI, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities, and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ VI player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about this Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which given how the way women were treated back then probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. But what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there. And Vietnam was a much smaller country, or kingdom I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That, that is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Avasi land lovers, ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you, thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm gonna ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. And maybe you can cast me in there. And I can put on some long red hair and some boots and I could, I could swim and just put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage per se than her, but it's 
her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap. Just don't. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat, and worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back in the tube when I was done with it. Oh, I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally. And now I gotta make my bed? Oh, this is the worst day ever. I'm sure no other cute boy with blue eyes like me ever had this problem. Number 10, queen of hating her daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times, and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number nine. Don't mess with the Empress. The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well, and I don't mean like slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number eight, mommy issues. Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime, but how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number seven, Rana Valona. I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian? Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Rene Valona I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay, and would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number six, pretty firmly against cheating. 
Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from, at first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on, just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm -mm. I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn. That ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number five, Bloody Mary, duh. Mary the first, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary the first ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number four, taking over. Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused the whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. 
She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost 12 million dollars by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number 1. Countess Not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560 Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam! Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord was she a bad dudette. Not good. Number 10, Marie Antoinette, Madame Deficit. The last queen of France and maybe the last time royals got away with, well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound, when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation will be worth 12 million dollars US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving and honestly, if people don't have anything including food, ooh, it's not going to be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing. And in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number 9. Queen Victoria. Oh blighty. Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time. I don't know. Cheese, I don't know. Big cheddar? We'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's 5 minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number 8. Cleopatra Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. Oh, she's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power and to not have one but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt but maybe had the most drama. Sure Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot, of, a lot of affairs happening. Number seven, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else. Something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say, it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. It was just 
big stupid cable. Can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash most likely within the next 12 hours. I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. God bless the queen. And God save the queen. Shout out to the UK. Chetty loves you. How you doing? Come, come and see me sometime. I love you guys. Now, sure, she's not the most awful spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like, for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. <laughs> no, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. Number five, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and what I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? Uh, blood is not as thick as water? Ah, I don't really know, it's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so, that's rough. However, that being said, sometimes Sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's weekend at Bernie's except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Ugh. Number three, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy, it wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks, spoiled princess calling, hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer, that lurk of the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water. 
that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh-huh, I one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So do you think his children grew up humble and wise? Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary. Number one is context on the missing queens. Lexi de los Santos, a Nat Geographic promoter, perfectly describes the treatment of Egyptian queens. Out of all the ancient civilizations, Egypt was the only one that really valued women, but after their rule, male leaders just erased all memory of these women because they didn't want them to have all that success. But why would ancient men in a culture that respected and revered women still strike them off the record in a fit of primal jealousy when they've been regal. It was best explained in the recent Bumblebee video, Top 10 Messed Up Things That Happened to Women in Ancient Egypt. It's the blame game. In ancient Egypt, pharaohs were supposed to be the human incarnate of the gods, but one thing that the male gods, female gods, and human females all had in common was the truest power, the womb, the ability to create and birth life, Ra's greatest creation. All of mankind came from Ra, the king god, yet any man who sat on the throne as Pharaoh, meant to be the incarnate of Ra, was missing that one true power. So what that meant is any time a female Pharaoh took the throne, she was more akin to the king god by the Egyptians own definition than the male Pharaoh ever could be. Call that a mic drop. Consequently, if the womb wielders had a built in facet of power that you can't regulate, recreate, nor have for yourself, chances are you're going to be pretty snubbed. So if she's also a better ruler than her male counterparts, you're going to be resentful. Unfortunately, this means the documentation of many queens is lost to time. Their stories coming to us in broken pieces of pottery and papyrus, on ancient word of mouth from Greek and Rome, or from unidentified mummies that come and go as the sands blow thanks to the jealousy of mankind. Leader number nine will be Kenti Hase the first. So who was the first woman to rule Egypt? This will be the biggest debate of the video as there are technically three qualifiers. First candidate is Kenti Kase the first. She was born circa 2550-2520 BC and died sometime between 2510 and 2490 BC. The remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within her necropolis until its excavation in the 1930s. And since its discovery at Giza, her tomb has intrigued historians and archaeologists alike. The mausoleum is as grand as other pyramids of her predecessors and includes a solar boat, a chapel, granaries, and a water tank. A small structure known as the washing tent of the female king had been built in front of her temple and here the body was washed and ritually purified prior to being embalmed. Her mastaba is believed to have been the final royal tomb that was constructed at that necropolis and many scholars believe that it was strongly connected to the pharaohs of the fourth and fifth dynasties. On its granite doorway her formal title is construed to be the mother of the king of upper and lower Egypt holding office as king of Upper and Lower Egypt. In support of the latter title is her image, which is altered to show her in a kingly pose, including the false beard, the royal Uraeus cobra crown, and holding a scepter, one of the many adjustments and additions made up until the 6th century, imp implying that this pharaoh possibly had continued a role in religion and worship after her death. Kenti may have ruled as a regent for her presumed son, Sahur, possibly in conjunction with Yusarkaf, the founder of the 5th dynasty. However, despite the fact that she was apparently considered an ancestress of the 5th dynasty and was commemorated in the mortuary chapel of Absur at Kenikartes II, her name has never been found in a royal cartouche. Leader number 8 is Mernith. Among ancient Egypt's greatest female leaders was Queen Mernith, who had the overwhelming ambition to rule a country and stopped whoever 
shared that sentiment. Her name means the beloved niece, the daughter of King Dier, and beloved she seemed to be, until after she died and then the men didn't have to respect her anymore that is. Even if she wasn't the first woman to rule Egypt, she definitely seemed to be, but if historians wanted to debate endlessly, who am I to stop their fun? She definitely was the first woman to rule anything in known human history, because she was born about 3,000 years ago. Merneith stepped in as regent after her husband's death as their son, Den, was too young to rule at the time. Karakuni, an Egyptologist, said that these women were often used as protectors. Men would put women in high positions to keep young male leaders safe and give them time to mature. When a man was ready to take over as pharaoh, the woman in charge would step down. But Bernice was Old Kingdom Egypt, and when she assumed this tutelage, it was in despite of what religious traditions of the first dynasty decreed, that only men were to rule. Despite that, Merneith stood rigidly by her son for a full decade, from 2939 to 2929 BC, until he became one of the most prominent kings of Old Kingdom Egypt. Despite the fact that there are few records of her name in any tombs, her accomplishments and life, she's still believed to have been a figure of great power and simultaneously respected and despised. Either way, she's one of those pharaohs that was buried alongside 50 live servants. Leader number seven is Nikokris. The third and most mysterious candidate for the first female king of Egypt is recorded many centuries later in the work of the Egyptian historian Manitho. Her name is Nikokris, and she was believed to have lived around the 22nd century BC, which was towards the end of the sixth dynasty. Some have suggested that Nikokris was the last pharaoh of this dynasty. As Manitho tells us, she built the third pyramid and reigned for 12 years, but the whole third pyramid thing is an absolute disaster if you know anything about ancient Egypt. There's just so much BS around the kings list and the dynasties. We don't know who made it, and every time we think we do, someone else shows up in history and has it attributed to them. So, it's up in the air. Herodotus also mentions Nikokris, but in the colorful context that she had killed hundreds to avenge the Egyptian king, who had been slain by the people in a coup, and who happened to be her brother. The people had given the kingdom to Nikoris to rule after doing so. The story is, is that she had constructed an elaborate underground dining chamber under the guise of it being for her coronation, inviting all those she knew to be responsible for her brother's death, as well as anyone who knew of the coup plan but did nothing of it. This includes servants, concubines, officials, priests, the whole shebang. As the banquet progressed, Nikokris, surveying safely from a platform, had her servants open the floodgates and let the flow of the Nile River into the chamber through a concealed pipe, drowning all in attendance. To quote Herodotus, that is all the information I was given about Nikokris, except that afterwards she threw herself in a chamber full of ashes to avoid retribution. Leader number six is Sobenekfru. It's not until the end of the Middle Kingdom that we find for the first time 100% pure clear evidence of a female king. So her name was Sobenekfru and there are about five variations of her name, all harder to say than the last. However, the name Sobenekfru means the beauties of Sobek in reference to the crocodile god, one that the rulers of the 12th dynasty established a religious and economic center in Fayum IV, where crocodiles were nurtured and worshipped. Queen Sobenekfru rose to power after the death of her brother slash husband Amenhotep the fourth which made her the eighth ruler of Egypt's 12th dynasty and she went on to rule for nearly four years that was a lot of numbers in one sentence so I hope you're keeping up though missing her head in many the queen statues found in Fayum show that she appeared to combine masculine and feminine aspects of regal dress similar to many other female rulers of Egypt she is the last ruler prior to the new kingdom to appear in the offering list found at Abydos and Sekera which does suggest some kind of posthumous verdict that separates her from the kings who followed her with equally short reigns. How Sobenekfru died or where she was buried remains a mystery. Some have suggested that her burial might be in one of the pyramids at Mazgana, but this is very unlikely, as is Amenhat's labyrinth or Herkeopolis, both of which she contributed to. Thus, one of the most powerful women of the early world history remains a mystery. Leader number five is Cleopatra. Everyone knows Cleopatra. There's already been so much written about it, you could drown in it. Yet, we still know next to nothing about her. But thanks to a famous smear campaign against her by, hmm, everyone in ancient times, I can list off a few not so nice details about this queen to fit more into our repulsive theme. If you want to learn more about her life, maybe check out the recent top 10 filthy secrets of Cleopatra that'll make you blush video on our channel Bumblebee. Maybe while you're at it, subscribe to The Hive if you want to see more like it. Born in 69 BCE, Cleopatra's seventh Tia Philopater was bred to be a ruler, having come from a long line of royal siblings having children together, which makes the family tree look a lot more like a family ladder when drawn on paper, just... 
instead of like branching out roots. And apparently, sharing a bed with a cousin isn't enough, you have to share names too. About 90% of Cleopatra's family was either named Ptolemy or Cleopatra. Every now and then, a Bernice or an Arsenio was thrown in there to give us a break. I guess it would make interfamily relations a little bit less weird and more normalized if your dad, uncle, brother, brother, half brother, brother, a new husband slash brother, all have the same name, maybe a different Cleopatra who famously married two of her brothers and also killed at least one of them. The other one, she had somebody else do it for. Leader number four is Amos. Amos was the principal wife of Pharaoh Thutmose the first in the 18th dynasty and the mother of Hatshepsut, who went on to become one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. She had many titles, king's great wife, king's sister, hereditary princess, great of praises, and mistress of the two lands. However, it appears she is a rare occurrence of a primary wife not being of royal blood, which would explain why her probable son, Prince Amen Mones, was not mentioned in the Sebian mortuary chapel of Wadmos, which attests her husband's secondary wife and her sons. The whereabouts of Amos's tomb and mummy remain unknown, likely one of the many lost to pillaging and weird Victorian unwrapping parties. However, Stella found in Edefu that once belonged to an official called Yuf remains a testament to her existence. He recorded that the Queen Amos appointed him as an assistant treasurer and entrusted him with the service to a statue of Her Majesty. Amos owes a lot of thanks to her daughter, Hatshepsut, however, for plastering her face everywhere. As you'll learn in the next segment, Hatshepsut dedicated herself as a demigod and so put up many etchings and murals of her divine conception, the image of the god Amun approaching her mother, Amos, or some more compromising images of the two together. Good for Amos catching a god's attention. Leader number three is Hatshepsut. So, from mother to daughter, let's talk about this train wreck who was also the most most influential and long ruling Egyptian queen and was known to be a great diplomat during her 22 year reign. She is also regarded as the first great woman in recorded history. Hatshepsut was only the second known woman to assume the throne as king of Upper and Lower Egypt after Queen Sobanekfu, whom was the model for this pharaoh as a queen and whom she based many of her decisions upon. Upon Thutmose II's death, the throne was passed to Thutmose III and Hatshepsut, who was the aunt and stepmother, acted as regent until simply just taking the crown herself. Like pretty much every Egyptian queen short of Cleopatra, Hattie dressed in men's royal garb, wore a false beard, and created statues of herself with the pharaoh's headdress. During the seventh year of her reign, however, she went even further and asked to be depicted as a man, ordering to be referred to not as a queen, but as a king. Hattie surrounded herself with strong and loyal advisors, her favorite being the royal steward Senemut, who many believe was having an affair with the queen. The evidence for this claim is the fact that Hatshepsut allowed Senemut to place his name and image of himself behind one of the main doors of the Dieser Dessou, which is rare, and, and an unusual share of credit. That and plenty of graffiti made by peasants and workers depict the two in compromising positions. Not kidding. Ancient R-rated graffiti. Anyway, Hattie's reign was peaceful, a time where many monuments were erected of her, of Amun, who she claimed was her lineage was based off of, of Bastet, maybe a few more of her, you know, to be humble. However, after her death, her successor, who was possibly even her own stepson, attempted to erase all record of her destroyed statues, burnt documents, attempted to remove her presence from Egypt. This effort only half works. While we don't know much as we wish we could, Hatshepsut is still remembered to this day. Leader number two is Nefertiti. This is the queen married to the cult guy who was so hated in Egypt that everyone agreed to ignore that he had ever happened. Unfortunately, it means this beauty had her name tarnished in the process, call it canceled by association. That's why Taylor Swift broke up with the problematic singer guy, Maddie. I think the name alone is worth the breakup. Why are you in your mid thirties, but still going by Maddie? Nefertiti's name can translate to a beautiful woman has arrived and that she had from parents unknown. We haven't figured that part out. A life-size bust of the queen was found in 1912 and is her most famous image and depiction, and it shows she really was a stunner. To the extent it's believed that ancient Egyptians revered her as a fertility goddess embodied. However, other Egyptian art depicts Nefertiti in ways normally only pharaohs are shown. For instance, she's portrayed smiting enemies, such as on a ship, raising her right hand to kill female prisoners, a depiction often seen on male pharaohs. Additionally, the type of helmet-like crown Nefertiti is wearing in the bust is typically reserved for pharaohs or the goddess Tefnut or Hathor. One idea is that after Akhenaten's death, Nefertiti's power and popularity was so great she was able to rule as pharaoh in her own right. Egyptian records mention a figure named Neferen Fatuen, who ruled Egypt for a brief time. Like how actors took stage names, pharaohs actually took throne names and it's speculated this was the throne name for Nefertiti. This means our girl was on the throne for three years. But as you know, after her reign, the Egyptian people tried to wash her away to the best of their abilities. Took Mahan, 
undid Akhenaten's religious reform, Armana became abandoned, and images of Akhenaten and Nefertiti are destroyed. Where leader number one is Aset. You may know her by her Grecian name, however, Isis. She was the queen mother of all gods. Her name quite literally translates to queen of the throne, which is reflected in her headdress, which is sometimes a literal throne. However, sometimes it takes on traits from Hathors or Mutz to represent her assimilation with other women in the pantheon. While she seemingly started as a side figure to her husband Osiris, she was quickly transformed into the queen of the universe and an embodiment of cosmic order. By the Roman period, Aset was believed to control fate and linear existence itself. This is accredited to the story of Ra's secret name, where an Aset is able to find out the true name of Ra, something no other god knows, and ultimately makes her his equal, if not more powerful than he. Aset was the sister and wife of the god Osiris, ruler of the underworld. It is said that she and Osiris were in love with each other even within the womb. As he was king of Egypt, Isis was queen, and one who supported her husband and taught the women of Egypt to weave, bake, and brew beer. Set was always angry with this relation, as Isis reigned over the land of Egypt in the wake of the traveling Osiris instead of Set. She was stronger, and, and he regarded this with jealous eyes as well as the good works of his brother, for his heart was full of evil and he loved warfare better than peace. The queens frustrated his wicked designs, so he sought in vain to prevail in battle against her and plotted to overcome Osiris by Gal. This is how the famous story of Osiris' death, Horus' birth, and the grieving Aset prevails as one of Egypt's most famous stories. Set tricks Osiris into the coffin, which he tosses in the Nile. The grieving Aset refused to accept this and searched far and wide as a fugitive, birthing their son Horus on the journey. When she finds a coffin, she returns it to Egypt. Unfortunately, Set finds it hidden again and dismembers Osiris, scattering the pieces. Isis still refuses to relent. She finds the pieces and entombs them. Anubis, with the assistance of Thoth and Horus, united the severed portions of the body of Osiris, which they wrapped in linen bandage. Thus, the origin of the mummy form of the god. Osiris then became the judge and king of the dead, residing in the underworld, as Isis remained with Horus on the above. Queen Victoria was anti-women's rights. Ah, isn't that fun? Queen Victoria, who ruled England from 1837 until 1901, was in the perfect position to be the forerunner for the women's movement. Meanwhile, she's up in her office writing letters stating that the movement of the present day to place women in the same profession as men was mad and utterly demoralizing. She stated a woman's place was in the home and also condemned the idea of a woman becoming doctors or any career. In a letter written by Victoria to her uncle Leopold, king of the Belgians, she wrote that her husband Albert grows daily fonder of politics and business and is wonderfully fit for both. And I grow daily to dislike them both more and more. We women are not made for governing, and if we are good women, we must dislike these masculine occupations. Y'all, the queen wrote that. In 1850, the queen was faced with the women's franchise bill passing in parliament and began a very lengthy correspondence with Prime Minister William Gladstone, letting him know about her strong aversion to these so-called erroneous rights of women, and that she felt so strongly upon this dangerous, unchristian, and natural cry and movement of women's rights that she is most anxious that Mr. Gladstone and others should take some steps to check this alarming danger. Let woman be what God intended, a helpmate for man, but with totally different duties and vocations. Yeah, it didn't age well. And if you're doubting me, let's take a look at this petty beef. Queen Victoria was not for the girlies. She was a bitter and jealous B word a lot of the time and over many different things. One was Lady Flora Hastings, lady in waiting, but also very close friend to Victoria's mother, who in 1839 presented herself to the Queen's dock with abdominal pain and a severe gut swelling. Lady Flora had been part of the royal household during Victoria's upbringing when the young heir to the throne was subjected to a strict system of rules and regulations that left her isolated and unhappy. The queen still harbored that grudge against Flora because of her association with this bleak time and also her mother, who Victoria had serious mommy issues for. Anyways, Flora was unmarried, so the immediate visual symptoms led to an assumption she was preggers, out of wedlock. Demon ass Victoria rebels in this opportunity and she has former governess baroness, Lezen, obligingly spread the rumor that Flora is pregnant. Since Victoria suspected the father was a much hated guardian from her childhood, Sir John Conray, she threw that into boot. Hastings is public publicly humiliated, forced to protest her innocence, and undergo a gynecological examination, which proved in fact she was not pregnant. Her swollen stomach was due to advanced liver cancer and she died a couple weeks after. Conroy and others spearheaded a press campaign to slam the queen and her fellow conspirators for smearing and defaming the Lady Flora. It dented the young queen's popularity and at Flora's funeral two months later, the people quite literally dented her carriage when they stoned it. A lot of hypocrisy, especially from a woman of many 
lovers, one of whom was very obviously John Brown Scandal. The worst day of Queen Victoria's life, the day her husband Albert died. The second worst day of Victoria's life, when her loyal servant John Brown died. John Brown served as the Queen's constant companion and he pledged to be with her always. After the death of Albert, Victoria relied on her devoted manservant from Scotland for everything. Victoria's children referred to him as Mama's lover, naturally, due to the fact they slept in adjoining room. Heated gossip naturally made its way around, why Brown's shocking informal manner with the Queen and his high-handed rude ways with other royals seemed to suggest his closeness with Victoria, in the words of one contemporary insider, was contrary to etiquette and even decency. Speculation that the two secretly wed came out when the Queen's chaplain claimed on his deathbed that he performed the ceremony. There was also talk of three additional hidden children. Premarital relations between John Brown and Victoria are a possible marriage, it's never been proven. However, when Victoria died, she requested a photo of him be placed in her coffin along with a lock of his hair, some of his letters, and his mother's wedding ring he had gifted her. When Victoria died, her son Edward had any statuary destroyed or removed that talked of Brown. He also had 300 letters of his mother's burned. The British monarchy has been known to be better than the KGB at covering up its scandals and destroying evidence, and Abdul Karim is a great example. The portrayal of Karim in Western biographies is that of a rogue who manipulated the queen for wealth. Naturally, that's the classic British racism that brought us colonialism. Abdul was only 24 when he arrived in England, but Queen Victoria was smitten by the young man's intelligence, charm, and seriously hardcore work ethic, and admittedly his height. Victoria upped his status by making Abdul her teacher in the language of Urdu. In return, he introduced her to curry, Urdu writing, and even hookah. That's right, they were hotboxing castles, guys. The court was, meanwhile, repulsed. Abdul was Muslim and supposed to be a servant, and yet he was closer to the queen than anyone else in her immediate circle. Four decades his senior, Victoria brought Abdul with her on all her trips and treated him as a close companion. While a romantic relationship is insanely unlikely, the queen was signing her letters as dearest mother to Kareem, the two surely had a special bond. The English courtiers hated him, and Victoria chose to ignore that snobbish and racist behavior by forbidding it. Naturally, it doesn't make it go away, but it means it didn't happen in her presence. In her final wishes, she was quite explicit. Kareem would be one of the principal mourners at her funeral, an honor afforded to the monarch's closest friends and family. Victoria could not control what happened to the Munshi from beyond the grave, but she did everything in her power to mitigate the treatment she presumed that the family would inflict. Queen's fear is justified. Upon her death, Victoria's children worked swiftly to evict her mother's favorite advisor. Edward sent guards to the cottage Karim shared with his wife, seized all the letters from the queen, and burnt them on the spot. They instructed Karim to return to India immediately, without any fanfare or farewell, and Victoria's daughter Beatrice erased all reference to Karim in the queen's journals, an effing commitment given Victoria's decade plus relationship with them. The royal family's eradication of Karim was so thorough, a full 100 years would pass before an eagle eyed journalist noticed a strange clue left in Victoria's summer home on a tour. Her consequential investigation led to the discovery of Victoria's relationship, the worldwide attention of it, the novel, the movie, and the finding of his heirs. Meanwhile, when the queen didn't like you, it was back to the usual political agitation and request denied. In 1822, after a few small time jobs in the Tory governments over the years, Robert Peel became Home Secretary, where he famously established Metropolitan Police Force for London and reformed criminal law to reduce the number of offenses punishable by death and educate prisoners. In 1834, three years before the events of Victoria, Peel became Prime Minister of a minority Tory government, though his government struggled to pass legislation against the majority rival Whig Party and eventually resigned in frustration after just 100 days or so in power. Then in 1839, Peel got the chance to form the Tory government by Queen Victoria, but he asked in return she replace the Whig ladies of her household with Tory equivalents. Said ladies in waiting were her friends and many were married or related to the Whig ministers and MPs, so Peel refused to form government and Whigs returned to power. The Whig government was limping, but Victoria was passionately attached to Prime Minister Lord Melbourne and also refused to dismiss her female friends. It took the royal wedding of Albert and a failed attempt on their lives in the following year to revive the hatred that this gathered her from the public. And speaking of, Miss Victoria gave the progressive prime ministers endless hell. While lapping up the flattery of her favorite prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli, who famously admitted he laid it on with a trowel, she never hid her intense dislike of William Gladstone. His approach to the PM role was progressive social policies and she absolutely hated it. And his proposed plan for Irish home rule, which she considered a threat to her empire. Any name she could toss, she would. 
it. A mischievous firebrand, arrogant, tyrannical, obstinate, half crazy, wild, incomprehensible old fanatic. More than a few observers sensed there was an element of jealousy in her animity towards the people's William. He was always more liked than she was. When Gladstone won the 1880 general election, she announced to the world she would abdicate the throne rather than accept him as prime minister. Then offered two other liberal grandees the job who insisted Gladstone had to take it. Then she tried to force him to weed out the members of cabinet she didn't like. He refused. Her interventions failed to prevent her cabinets from achieving what they were determined to do, but she could wear them down. One of her prime ministers said handling her was like having a whole separate government department to deal with. But she just wasn't a pious wife or an eccentric widow. Queen Elizabeth was also a bad mama. Let's get it straight in clean cut, open, honest terms. Victoria did not like children, but she loved the act of making them, especially with Albert. Unfortunately, she was wildly fertile, so you want one of those things. In those days, you got the other thing. She definitely seemed to be one of the women who lacked inherent biological maternal instinct. That's never a flaw, ladies. You aren't broken, just so you know. Because intercourse during pregnancy was believed to harm babies back then, it meant for the better part of a year, she'd be banned from intercourse or even cuddling with Albert. The two things she wanted more than kids. It's honestly quite fair from her position that she resented her children between being deprived of her husband, not wanting children in the first place, and lacking a maternal drive. Victoria, we should remember, didn't also have much of an experience of a family life, and she was raised under isolated conditions. Victoria, in many respects, was an awful mother as a result. She couldn't help but view her nine children as functional extensions of herself, expecting unquestioning obedience, and was bullying them about their failings. When Bertie, the future Edward IV, rebelled against the rigid system his parents devised for him, she called him backwards and lazy. And when Victoria, who had decided Beatrice would be the unmarried companion of her old age and forbade mentions of weddings in her presence, learned her daughter was secretly engaged, she was so angry she refused to speak to her for six months. She only relented when Beatrice agreed to live with her after they were married. This ain't just some fun and games, this is the Baccarat scandal. Queen Victoria's son, the future King Edward IV, was a notorious playboy and hedonist. His passions included eating, banging, and gambling, with the latter landing him in very hot water in 1891. It starts with a game of Baccarat during a party at the country home of a shipping millionaire. One of the players was Sir William Gordon Cumming, another infamous playboy who was once described as possibly the most handsome man in London, but certainly the rudest. Gordon Cumming was alleged to have cheated during the Baccarat game, an accusation he angrily denied. So as toddy British gents, they have a tea and a chat and come up with an agreement that all players would say nothing of this grave offense if Gordon Cumming signed a declaration promising to never play cards again as long as I live. Not a hard ask. Yeah, no, he signed it for nothing. Much to Gordon Cumming's annoyance, the story did leak and became a high society gossip. And like a toddy British gent, Gordon Cumming decided to sue several of the background players for slander. The trial was a media circus, the future king appearing in the witness box and society ladies watching through their little opera glasses. Gordon Cumming did lose the case. However, the public was largely sympathetic to him and resented Edward for his part in the whole ugly affair. The prince became deeply unpopular for a time was even booed at Ascot the same month. Another child of Elizabeth's caused a media circus that had her mama reeling. It's the scandal coded daughter. Princess Louise seemed to rebel from the moment she came into the world. She was an exceptional learner, talented, intelligent, artistic, big on women's rights movement, and the most beautiful of Victoria's four daughters. Although an artistic career, or in the words of Victoria, any career, was not appropriate for a princess, let alone a woman, the queen allowed Louise to attend art school and later the National Art Training School. Now, on to the nasty. Historians assert that Louise had an affair with her brother's tutor. Some accounts state she fell in love with him in the years of 1866 to 1870, but it's not determined if anything physical occurred or if it was just a real big crush. Hearing of Louise's infatuation for a man 14 years her senior, the queen quickly dismissed him. Louise, after a couple years, had an affair with the tutor, Walter Sterling, and she purportedly gave birth to his child. As soon as Louise gave birth, the queen arranged for the boy's adoption by the royal gynecologist, Frederick Lowcock. There's no documentation to uphold it. Why would they keep that? They're trying to hide it. Louise served as an unofficial secretary for her mother from 1966 to 1871 and worked closely with the Queen's assistant, private secretary, Arthur Big. Rumor has it that these two had an affair. Yet the most scandalous rumor about Louise surfaced at 
the death of the famed sculptor Joseph Edgar Bohm, tales spread of him dying in her arms as they made love. In 1890, Louise married a dashing John Campbell. They did have an unhappy marriage, no children, and grew apart. At this point, Louise became romantically linked to Edward Lutons, Colonel William Prober, and an unnamed musician master, pissing off her mom all along the way. And because her children weren't causing Victoria enough problems, then came the Cleveland Street Scandal. One of the most sordid scandals connected with the royals unfolded in 1889 when a post officer messenger was investigated on suspicion of theft because he was discovered to be in the possession of 14 shillings he could not have earned doing that job. The troubled youth is pressured to admit he had earned it in a male brothel. Bit of a big info drop seeing as homosexuality was super illegal back then. The son of Albert Edward is named Albert Eddie Victor and was second in line to the throne of England at the time. At 21 years of age, he attended Trinity College where he made friends with Oscar Browning, a man known to favor attractive male undergraduates and was also connected to said male brothel the police just found out about. When the police uncovered then questioned those working in the brothel, apparently some names came out. Eddie. His father intervened in the investigation and no evidence against Eddie could be found or proven. That in the Cleveland Street investigation led to some working boys being given suspiciously light sentences. So there's press speculation that the indescribably loathsome scandal was being swept under the carpet to protect some high ranking visitors to the house. One VIP linked with the brothel was Lord Henry Arthur Somerset, the head of the stables. The next year, Eddie became ill with what may have been venereal disease. Doctors in attendance referred to it as fever and rumors spread of Eddie's intimate relations with a chorus girl of the Guy D Theater, Lydia Manton, and later chorus girl, Maud Richardson. The royal family reportedly paid off Maud for her silence. Shortly after, Eddie proposed to Mary of Tech, and she accepted to great relief of the royal family. But the wedding never happens. He succumbs to influenza pandemic in 1889 to 92, and he developed pneumonia and died very shortly after his 28th birthday. Whether or not he was part of the Cleveland Street brothel scandal, we'll never truly know. All right, we've hit the end of our list. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more from us.